Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of God, the All Compassionate, the All Merciful. Hello, everyone. In this video, we are going to examine the thoughts of Ibn Arabi and Plotinus. I created a separate video for each of these thinkers. In the first one, I'm uh, discussing the doctrine of uh, the unity of existence or oneness of being in Fusus al Hikam of Ibn Arabi. That is the seals of wisdom, which is one of his masterpieces. In the other video, I explained the theory of emanation through Plotinus's Enneads. In this video, we are going to talk about how these two um, doctrines can help each other. What are the similarities? What are the differences? How can they complement each other? <laughs> The material I discuss in this video come from my uh, recently published book. Um, in the first chapter of this book, I'm discussing uh, biographies of the two thinkers, but more importantly, the frame of thought for Ibn Arabi and mysticism in general. Can mystical experience be trusted? And uh, is it literally the philosophy understood in its modern sense that Ibn Arabi was practicing philosophy? If, if not, what was it? So that's what I'm discussing in the first chapter. In the second chapter, I'm discussing the doctrine of Wahdat al-Wujud, or the unity of existence, or the oneness of being, from Ibn Arabi's perspective. And the third chapter, the theory of emanation, doctrine of the one in Enneads. Now, in the fourth chapter, that is the subject matter of this video, I uh, like put together these theories to see how they can complement each other, how they can help each other, what are the similarities, what are the differences. Considering the length of video uh, in this one, I'm not going to uh, get into the technicalities of the matter or in details. I will just touch upon the main points of chapter 4. Examining both doctrines, one cannot help but realize that uh, Ibn Arabi, who is um, influenced by Plotinus, um, and it's not just Ibn Arabi, the whole Islamic, Christian, Judaic philosophy, uh, and uh, theology for that matter, uh, are influenced by uh, the thought and philosophy of uh, Plotinus. But um, in the first chapter of, of the Seals of Wisdom, that is the Fasus al Hikam, Ibn Arabi explicitly says that this book is not the result of um, discursive thinking or philosophy for that matter, uh, it's the result of intuitive knowledge. Now, God's messenger uh, put this knowledge in my heart. So, how do we, how do we make sense of this? Um, how do we ignore this uh, influence from Plotinus? Well, I, I argue here that uh, the influence of Plotinus on Ibn Arabi is just unquestionable. But the point is that uh, Ibn Arabi's confession that this is a uh, divine knowledge that came to him does not discredit the similarities between the two thinkers. The same light that enlightened uh, the seals of wisdom might have shown upon uh, the annals. So these similarities uh, do not discredit uh, the influence discussed here. There are certain themes in both annals and uh, the seals of wisdom. Um, like there were, yes, similarities and differences, but uh, there were simil similarities and differences around particular concepts, around particular topics. So uh, in chapter four, I'm um, pointing to these similarities and differences with regards to those concepts. Then at the end of the book, I put them together, these similarities, differences, to see what comes out of it, to see like how, how they can help each other. The first similarity is with regards to creation. For example, in Ennads 3, um, Plotinus says this, generation is a contemplation. It results from the longing of pregnancy to produce a multiplicity of forms and objects of contemplation to fill everything with reason and never to cease from contemplation. Begetting means to produce some form and this means to spread contemplation everywhere. I'm rereading the first part. It says generation is a contemplation. It results from the longing of pregnancy to produce a multiplicity of forms and objects of contemplation. So um, the picture that comes out here is that uh, the one in Plotinian uh, 
terminology you know, produced uh, an array of things, uh, a multiplicity of things as objects of contemplation. This is clearly um, in resemblance to what Ibn Arabi says. For example, in chapter one of The Seas of Wisdom, he says, the real wish to see the essences of his names, which are infinite in number, or you could say he wished to see his essences in an all comprehensive being, which being qualified with existence encompassed the order of all names so that in it he could manifest his mystery to himself. And the picture that comes out of this text is um, the real al-haqq in Arabic, uh, wish to see the essences of his names. According to Ibn Arabi, the real was contemplating uh, his names essentially, uh, but he created the world as an object, as a mirror to contemplate uh, his names externally in the corporeal form and for this purpose he created the world and we understand from this text that every part of the world is like a mirror is like a locus that reflects um, divine names and qualities and we discussed this in, in the previous second chapter and uh, in, in, in the first video that you have uh, most probably watched before that uh, the most uh, the best reflecting part the most comprehensive reflection happens through human beings because of his or her yeah, all-comprehensive, all-inclusive nature. So the second point of resemblance is with regards to divine emanation. For both Ibn Arabi and Plotinus, uh, all existence emanate, is manifested from, flows from um, a principle. So emanation starts from the top, and by top we of course do not mean uh, ge uh, geometrically, and uh, comes to the bottom. And the lower the emanation gets, uh, the less real it gets. And both Ibn Arabi and Plotinus acknowledge this. Then both these thinkers uh, acknowledge that uh, this emanation is uninterrupted. It's not that uh, God created the world and just then let it go and separated himself from it. Uh, in both these cosmological doctrines, uh, God is in contact with the world. Uh, he is disclosing himself. He is uh, granting us his uh, manifestation at every moment. And it is uninterrupted for both, think for both thinkers. And uh, in this sense, everything is, uh, they say, both Ibn Arabi and Plotinus, everything is the real and not the real. The real in that they emanate, they derive from the one. And um, not real in that they are essentially uh, non-existence, they are contingent, possible beings, uh, they are not essential. The only essential being, the only essential reality is uh, the real himself, God. And that's why they call it the doctrine of Wahdat al-Wujud, like the unity of existence, the oneness of being. There is but one single reality and that one reality is uh, disclosing himself in through different manifestations, uh, through different forms, as if a single light is taking up different masks in every locus, in every mirror that is uh, the corporeal uh, entities in this world. Another point is both mystics acknowledging that, that God has penetrated existence, has permeated existence through the emanation. And um, for example, we see this in Ibn Arabi, um, he says the real is in every existent in the world in proportion to that existence reality. So in Ibn Arabi cosmology, there is this concept. It's too much to open up in this video. Uh, you need to read the related part from the book. There's just too much going on there. Um, so in Ibn Arabi cosmology, the divine names are like molds, are um, what he calls al um, thabita that is the fixed entities. So the divine light, the essential light, passes through these molds and uh, appears as colorful uh, lights that we see. And those colorful beings, of course, in the simile, are the uh, existent entities, the corporeal entities in the world. So um, we each and every being, not just humans, every being in the world, every entity in the world has this aptitude in his or her or in its uh, fixed entity, Aynath Thabit. And uh, so, says Ibn Arabi, God pours existence into, into that mold, into that um, aptitude. So what appears comes from the aptitude uh, that each entity has in its, um, in its reality. So that's what he means when he, say, when he says, the real is in, is in every existent in the world in proportion to that existence reality. 
we see this picture in Plotinus too. Um, he says, humans are like living temples manifesting in divine present. In another place he says, I'm trying to make whatever is divine within me rise back up to whatever is divine in the universe. Uh, so in, in, in these uh, thinkers' uh, thought, uh, God is present in the world, not in a pantheistic sense. I've, I've rejected in this book that um, these doctrines are pantheism, and I have my reasons, I will not uh, explain them here. So the God is present in the world, um, and this is not just something uh, this does not just have metaphysical implications it also has, has ethical impl implications so um, when we see and we realize that uh, the divine the real is um, manifested in the world everything every entity that we see is kind of an emanation uh, from him so we gotta treat everything with respect we gotta treat everyone uh, with respect humans animals environment which needs so much help these days so this is a nice implication i think that comes out of these thinkers doctrines despite these similarities i have argued Ibn Arabi and plotinus's explanations concerning divine emanation differs in some in some sense and this is a very crucial point um look in in Ibn Arabi in cosmology we said uh, that there are fixed entities there are intelligible entities, the, the molds through which the divine light appears takes up the form of existence. But Ibn Arabi tells us that, uh, yes, in one sense, these fixed entities are um, those molds that bring about all these, through which uh, the light brings about all this existence. But in another form, but in another aspect, they are the intelligible forms of divine names. Those fixed entities al ayana thabita or the intelligible forms of divine names so in creation in ibn arabi's thought um, the whole creation has happened yes through emanation but through divine names and qualities that emanation happens through uh, through the divine names because of the multiplicity of the names and qualities that same single light appears through these names in different forms in different colors uh i, I have only one hand for quotation mark in, in different colors uh, all over the world uh, so what we do not see this in plotinus in plotinian cosmology uh, divine names do not play the role that they play in um, ibn arabi's frame of thought and this is a, a point uh, of difference between the two doctrines and this discredits uh, some of the claims that we hear these days that um, Islamic metaphysics is a copy of Neoplatonism uh, no it's not a copy like there is this originality there and of course uh, like the uh, the influence is not uh, rejectable and it's cherished we, we, we acknowledge that and we like that um, but uh, there are other dimensions to Islamic metaphysics uh, that were not discussed in um, in some philosophers in uh, Platonian or even Platonic um, Greek uh, philosophies. Um, for both Ibn Arabi and Plotinus, uh, the thing that uh, makes the corpse of the world alive is the soul. For instance, we have from Plotinus, the soul flows into the tranquil mass that is, uh, by, by which he means the corpse of the cosmos, from all sides, streaming into it, spreading through it, until it is luminous. The soul's animating omnipresence gives value to the universe that before was no more than an inert corpse, darksome matter and non-being. Similarly, Ibn Arabi says, God breathed his spirit into the unpolished form and incomplete corpse of the world, and his soul made the amorphous form alive, so here uh, there is this um, hint to the Quran. Um, in the Quran, God says, That is, I breathed, uh, I breathed my spirit into him, into Adam. That's why in Islamic metaphysics, uh, we say uh, that God created the world, animated the world through his breath, because he says, I breathed my spirit into Adam. And um, in Another sense, says Ibn Arabi, um, the, the, the world was this dark matter, this inner corpse, and uh, to rejuvenate it, to animate it, 
um, because it was missing something, um, God created uh, the soul of Adam. And here Adam is not Adam the prophet, Adam as the perfect uh, human being, as the perfect man, and insan al-kamil, as Ibn Arabi says, uh, it's a technical terminology. So um, he, he, in Ibn Arabi's thought, the world is animated by human being soul, not the individual human being, but the perfect man as um, this general all-inclusive being. Another point, and I think there is uh, lots of gap here to be filled. Uh, this point calls for a lot of research. Um, the concept of intellect and the intelligible entities in both these thinkers' um, philosophies. So, on the one hand, we have uh, Plotinus's uh, second hypostasis, that is, the intellect that is lower in existence than the one, but higher exi in existence than the soul. So, um, this concept we also see in Ibn Arabi. Islamic metaphysics uh, refers to this, uh, this, this concept with different names, uh, like first intellect, universal intellect, um, Muhammadan reality. But uh, whatever we name it, the picture is uh, quite similar here. Um, so for both thinkers, intelligible entities are timeless, shapeless, unaltering, mutually inclusive, and one yet separate entities, things, of which corporeal entities come, in, uh, come into existence. So um, I just discussed this in with regards to Ibn Arabi's uh, fixed entities. So we said they are like molds through which... Uh, existent entities through which the corporeal entities come to be and the same goes for Plotinus. Everything in this world is a copy of those realities, of those intelligible entities. Not that they are essences in uh, Ibn Arabi, in Ibn Arabi's cosmology. Um, and this is uh, where some translations go wrong. Fixed entities are not essences, they are not archetypes, they are, they are what we call quiddity in philosophy. They are the whatness. Of, uh, of all entities in the world. It's not that there are some essences sitting up there waiting to come to this world. They are basically nothing. Uh, that's why they, 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 some mystics and philosophers in Islamic thought call, them, uh, call that world the world of um, the mirror of nothingness. The mirror of nothingness. But there are some differences about intellect and the intelligible entities um, between the two thinkers. Plotinus tells us that the individual intellects are the essences of the corporeal entities dwelling in the intellect, period. Ibn Arabi acknowledges this definition, but he introduces another dimension to these intelligible entities. To the Andalusian thinker, intellects are, in another sense, as we just discussed, uh, the intelligible forms of divine names. So we do not see this in, uh, in, uh, in Plotinus's uh, philosophy. Second, Plotinus writes, if the idea of man, and this is a very interesting point, uh, this difference, I mean. If the idea of man exists in the intelligible realm, there must exist there as well the idea of reasoning man and of artistic man. He adds, the ideas will be of universals, not of Socrates as an individual man. Universals. Um, there is no Socrates in the, um, these uh, intelligible entities, he says. Uh, there is, let's say, artistic man. There is this philosopher a human being, but uh, who is he? Is it uh, me, you, him, her? No, just uh, in a universal sense. But for Ibn Arabi, uh, this th this is a controversial matter. This is my reading, and uh, many have also acknowledged this. For example, uh, the, the, the great Persian uh, commentator of uh, Ibn Arabi's uh, Fasus al-Hikam, who's uh, right now alive, uh, living, Muvahid. Um, so he also acknowledges this, and uh, the great uh, Ibn Arabi scholar in Turkey, Ikram Demirli, also acknowledges this. Uh, I think that um, what we read from of Susal Hikam, it appears that uh, when Ibn Arabi is discussing fixed entities, he's not just referring to these uh, universal human being um, up there. It appears that there is also um, fixed entities of individual human beings. There is a fixed entity of me, Rasul. There is a fixed entity of you, whoever is watching this video. I don't know your name. And um, so there is this individuality there. Um, because at some parts of the text, um, 
we see this clearly and i have discussed this in the second chapter if you want to uh, read that section carefully just go to second chapter i'm not going to be discussing it here it's just too much for now so that is uh, where another point where Plotinus and Ibn Arabi differ. Again, uh, another similar point is uh, the relationship between the intelligibles and corporeal entities. Um, for, for our thinkers, fixed entities, or essences as Plotinus calls them, determine everything about corporeal existence. Yes, they are uh, intelligible. They do not set foot per se uh, on the corporeal world, but they determine everything about the entities in the corporeal world. So next category comes um, with regards to the one. Um, say for Plotinus and Ibn Arabi, both of them speak of an all transcendent supreme source from which everything originates and to which they return. So this original, this source, this principle is uh, quite similar uh, for Ibn Arabi and Plotinus. Uh, so I'm going to subcategorize this into several sections. The first one is the soul's circular motion around the one and its bewilderment. According to Plotinus, the soul moves circularly around the inner center, around an inner circle, the place in this point where all centers converge. Speaking of the one, says uh, Plotinus, we should not say that the one is this or that, but revolving, so to speak, around it. Try to express our own experience of it, getting close to it, um, getting far from it, falling back from it as a result of the difficulties involved. Uh, this is uh, same for Ibn Arabi. Um, he says in moving towards the one, the best path is a circular one, because if you set um, a goal in your mind, so if you have a picture of that ending point uh, in your mind, you're limiting uh, that point. If we are seeking God, if we have a picture in our mind that God is this, that, he is not this, that, we are limiting him uh, to our thought, we are bringing him down to our uh, intellectual faculties. Um, so, says Ibn Arabi, instead of having something particular in your mind, uh, the, the motion uh, in searching the one is uh, a cir circular path. And I think by now you will realize uh, what Rumi's uh, whirling Vance represents. So for Ibn Arabi, that goal is unimagined, undetermined, and unlimited. Thus, for both thinkers, uh, the path is a circular path, not a straight one. The second subcategory is uh, unity of the contemplative and the one. Plotinus says, in contemplation, the contemplative is absorbed into the one. He gets to perfect at oneness with it. He wants with it. He's using one as a verb. He wants with it. This experience is self-transcendence, simplification, self-abandonment, a striving for union and a repose, an intentness upon confirmation. To Ibn Arabi, because the human being's inner aspect is divine, piercing of the veils, the contemplative finds uh, the one in, in himself and realizes that the one sees, hears and speaks through him. So for both, both, both uh, mystic philosophers, um, the contemplative transcends himself in the union with the one. And this should be emphasized that in this unity, it's not that two realities are, um, uh, are at hand. It's not that there is a human being and uh, just, just uh, journeys um, and finds the real, finds another, another entity for that matter. Um, so what is happening is that there is but one entity. It's just that um, our faculties are, are, are covered through multiplicity. And when through some exercises, you should uh, delve into that to see how, when through some exercises, uh, through some considerations, you pierce off your, those whales, you find that there is no separation, the distinction uh, between the one and the created. Um, in a special sense, not in that, uh, not in pantheistic sense. Essentially, we are the real, uh, but we are present through multiplicity and through form. And um, so, piercing of those veils, you find God in you. You find uh, the real in you. And at that moment, uh, Ibn Arabi says, God speaks through you. He hears through you. He sees through you. So a human being is the vicegerent, he's the agent through which 
um, the real contemplates the world and speaks to the world. Another common point for Plotinus and Ibn Arabi is that the human being is the microcosm and the cosmos is the macrocosm. Common to them too is the notion of man, the image. And this is a very interesting text from Plotinus. He says, if the contemplative uh, could see herself in contemplation, she would realize that she is the one's image. And this notion uh, has well influenced uh, Islamic um, Christian and Judaic thought, and Ibn Arabi points to it on several occasions in Ibn Infosus. So next subcategory, what I have called the uh, panacea for knowing the one. How do we know the one? Both mystics acknowledge the one's undifferentiated oneness that hides him from being captured. So there is no distinction in the divine essence. There is no shape, color, any quality. So in order to perceive something, there should be a distinction in the divine essence. Uh, there is no such uh, distinction. And um, uh, I cannot reduce it to, that, to this simple explanation. So um, we will get into that. But um, the divine essence is something that cannot be reduced to humans uh, cognitive faculties and explanations and logical roots. Um, we will talk about that more. To Plotinus, in contemplation, seeing the one is difficult. When the soul seeks to know in its own way by coalescence and unification, it, the soul, is prevented by that very unification from recognizing it has found the one, since it is unable to distinguish the knower and the known. Uh, so when the soul unites with the one, because that subject, ma object, knower and known duality is uh, eliminated, uh, the soul uh, at times does not realize that uh, she has uh, found the destination, she is at the destination. Similarly, says Ibn Arabi, none sees him other than he and none perceives him other than he. His veil is only a consequence and effect of his oneness. Nothing wails other than he. His veil is only the concealment of his existence in his oneness without any quality. Another very important point is the two mystics' discussion of uh, discursive thought, discursive thinking. Yes, we should follow discursive thinking. We should follow philosophy and logic. And they do that. This is how they write their books. But uh, we should also acknowledge the limitations of these, uh, of these approaches. Discursive thought is limited to our faculties, um, our, our methods. The same goes with logic. And when something is um, beyond, something that transcends all these limitations, we cannot reduce that entity down into these uh, mental forms, uh, these rules that we have created. For example, uh, Plotinus says the aim of using discursive re reason in uh, speaking of the one is not to convince the audience on philosophical grounds, this is my paraphrase, but to guide the, the seeker, but to guide the seeker towards the mystical vision. The awareness of the one comes to us neither by knowing nor by the pure thought, but by presence, emphasis, presence, transcending knowledge. Yes, we do philosophy, yes, we use philosophy, yes, these mystic philosophers used philosophy, but the point to realize is that uh, they both acknowledge very openly that these are uh, intuitive knowledge. Um, the things that they write uh, come through intuition. So the point, the picture is here is this, uh, the knowledge comes to them through intuition, through divine contemplation, and um, they, they, this is how they receive it. But when they speak it to us, when they transfer it to us, at, at this stage they resort to philosophy, not here. The knowledge, the, the, the conclusions they, they draw do not come from uh, philosophy or logical rules, but through intuition, through contemplation. But when they want to clarify, explicate their experiences, they use philosophy so that they can transfer that information to us. Now, how can the two doctrines help each other? I think uh, one of the points uh, that Ibn Arabi could help uh, Plotinus is his uh, systematic use of uh, tanzi and tashbi, that is uh, transcendence and imminence. Plotinus also comes close. Um, he uses it like he in speaking of the one he, he is uh, following this. Uh, uh, transcendence eminence approach, but he's not using it as systematically as Ibn Arabi. And I think if he did, his language would would just flourish when he was speaking about these. 
In chapter 3 of the Seals of Wisdom, Ibn Arabi states, uh, one who holds only God's transcendence to the world is an heir, since in doing so one, one accepts God partially and limits him. One who holds God's imminence in the world is also in error, since in doing so one restricts him. To understand the world, to understand the real, says Ibn Arabi, one should consider him as both transcendent to and imminent in the world. So, you see, this, this moving uh, through the lines of transcendence and imminence uh, could open up uh, uh, Plotinus's uh, language a little bit uh, when he's discussing his uh, hypotheses. Yes, he does this. I, I'm not saying that he doesn't, but he's not using it as systematically as Ibn Arabi. Journeying within transcendence and imminence would also help Plotinus in his other assertions. For example, he holds uh, that the one has neither existence nor essence, because if it did, it would be limited. This way he limits, I think, he limits uh, the one by saying that the one does not have existence or does not have essence. Just because the human language cannot express the divine nature adequately doesn't mean that God does not have an essence because having an essence would limit him. The problem here is with the human language. And uh, so in, discuss in discussing uh, the divine essence, there is this beautiful passage from Seto and Nasser and I'm going to read that. Uh, I think uh, it would um, shed light on the point we're discussing. The divine essence is a center in which all oppositions are united and which transcends all the polarizations and contradictions in the world of multiplicity. It is the center of the circle in which all is unified and before which the mind stands in bewilderment, for it involves, for it involves a coincidentia oppositorum pardon my Latin, which cannot be reduced to categories of um, human reason and cannot be and cannot be explained away as a, a monism, which annihilates um, ontological distinctions and which overlooks the transcendence position the center occupies in relation to all the oppositions that are resolved in it. The exterior and the interior are apparent oppositions that are resolved in the divine essence, which encompass and contain, and contain all these polarities without being reduced to them. Now, how can uh, Plotinus help Ibn Arabi? One of the points that the Egyptian thinker could help Ibn Arabi with is um, through his theory of, theory of emanation. When uh, Ibn Arabi is discussing his cosmology, this uh, theory could shed uh, further, right, further light on, um, on the parts of his uh, expli explication. Uh, for example, uh, this clarifies, uh, this theory uh, clarifies uh, Ibn Arabi's um, world of imagination and, uh, and the soul's relation and role in creation. Uh, this is, I think, where uh, Plotinus could help Ibn Arabi. Another point is that uh, uh, um, yes, Ibn Arabi, is, Ibn Arabi is a serious philosopher, but he has this mystical uh, approach when he's uh, writing. So he speaks um, more mystically than philosophically. I think Plotinus goes the other way around. He speaks more philosophically. So I think uh, Plotinus's sharp uh, tongue, or sharp philosophical tongue, could help Ibn Arabi greatly. Because sometimes it's very um, difficult to understand some parts of Ibn Arabi's texts, and he is actually notorious for his um, complex uh, passages. So I think this is a, a point where Plotinus could be of help. Um, and if Ibn Arabi could have done this, he would have made uh, understanding his texts a little bit easier, so we could access the texts with ease. This is the end. I hope this video could shed some light on um, the thoughts of these philosopher mystics. Thank you for watching till the end and may God bless you.